All right, what is up, everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you here today. We have finally made it uh, to episode six. I am finishing up. This is 11.09 p.m. Um, the last episode of the McMahon documentary was entitled The Finish. Um, I, I made it through. I know a lot of people on Twitter were able to, to, to watch the entire thing. I know that, like, Eric Bischoff, uh, and um, Conrad, they're watching one episode a day, and they're going on live uh, YouTube in order to talk about each episode by episode um, to break things down. That That's a pretty uh, good way to watch the show. Um, I, I just mainly just wanted to consume it because from the moment that it was released that it was coming, we were told so many times it's coming, it's not coming, WWE killed it, Vince bought it. Um, we were told so many different things that, like, to finally get it. I think everybody's heard the story of uh, Chris Hemsworth um, was was supposed to make a Hulk Hogan, like, movie. Um, and, and people say that that thing is, is never going to see the light of day. These people say that that thing is dead. For this to really come out was big to me. Even if it, even if it was going to be good, even if it was going to be bad, I, I thought that this was really, really good. And um, I know that they have the 2006 McMahon documentary that WWE made. This is like an updated version that gets you right up to the end. The unfortunate situation is the end is bad. It is it is bad, bad. No, no, no good <laughs> comes out of the end of this documentary. But there was, you know, episode one, which didn't really touch on anything bad. Everything in episode two need to be talked about in order to be talking about the history of Vince McMahon. Um, you know, episode three with the attitude. Um, no, episode three was the screw job. Four was family business. Uh, this one right here, I, I mean, you know, they, they touch on things. They, they hit things really, really fast in this one. I think they touch on, you know, things in wrestling that... You know, the CTE situation went really, really fast. The Chris Benoit situation went really, really fast. This was the episode that honestly really, really seemed to be rushed, other than like giving subtle, subtle hints of the finish of Vince McMahon's uh, career in WWE, um, other than just giving sort of hints to it. This is the one where they went in and probably did the most editing to in order to give it uh, a real proper finish. You could really tell that when they were talking about WrestleMania 38, that that was probably where they thought they were going to end the the documentary with him leaving um, AT and T Stadium and flying away on the helicopter. Um, I don't think that would have been him saying goodbye, but I think that was going to be the end of the documentary, and that's where they basically had to uh, come in and 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 start telling the story of. Um, you know, the, the allegations coming in with the $3 million lawsuit and uncovering that $12 million had been paid to four different wrestlers. Um, one of them was uh, $7.5 million in 2005 uh, for, for a former wrestler who had been sexually harassed and then basically forced into, you know, well, I guess he wasn't forced, talked into giving him oral sex, you know, only to be having their contract not picked up and then being being fired and released from WWE. Um, that, 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 that's down the road. I mean, we'll get to it. That's the stuff that's going to be hard to, to talk about. But um, I, I got notes on it, so we'll hit it when we get there. Um, the finish um, basically starts with Vince McMahon talking about how his brain runs and how it works. And he basically says it. He's able to concentrate on what's ahead of him, but most of the time he has a separate computer screen that is just running through the motions and is thinking about its own things. And there's even times when there's a third screen on and he's thinking about three different things all at the same time. And they just flat out ask him, like, what is your second screen thinking about right now? And I don't know if he was feeling frisky that day and just, decided to give the right answer and maybe he thought it was like tongue in cheek at the time maybe they wouldn't use it maybe they would use it and it would kind of play into the Mr. McMahon character but he was saying he just was thinking sexual thoughts 
of different sexual positions. And they used it. <laughs> it did not really make any sense. Um, we had um, the Doctor of Shoes uh, from Cheap Heat's early days come on. And, and he talked about the problems that, um, you know, WWE was having at the time. Was, you know, they had Stone Cold Steve Austin. They didn't really know, you know, how or where to use them. I, I thought maybe that after I wrote down Steve Austin, maybe he meant Vince McMahon. Um, because right after that, they go right into, um, talking about Donald Trump, um, being involved with the WrestleMania, um, 22 in Detroit. Maybe they're talking about Stone Cold Steve Austin because the fact he was a special guest referee and that was one way to get him involved. But, um, Trump did really well, really well. He was a huge star at the time. He had really no political aspirations. He was only Donald Trump who was the main star of the NBC reality game show, uh, I guess, of um, uh, the, the Apprentice. WrestleMania 23 ended up uh, going on to being the biggest, yeah, yeah the biggest wrestling pay-per-view by rate of all time. Huge, huge, uh, big numbers. Um, and, and it, it, it was entertaining and I bet there was a lot of people at that time cheering, um, for, for Donald Trump that, uh, today's day probably wish they never did. Um, uh, we basically go to, um, I wrote the death of Vince and I don't remember why. Uh, but they go into uh, the Chris Benoit um, situation with uh, Vince McMahon being asked about it and basically saying that he doesn't take any of the responsibility of what Chris Benoit did. He thought that he was a, a really great in-ring technical wrestler. He felt that he was a really good guy. He never showed signs of being somebody that seemed like he was going to murder his entire family. But um, they use that to sort of splice into Chris Nowinski, a former um, wrestler who, who got uh, to WWE through a reality show on MTV called Tough Enough. Uh, his career was, was ended short in his first year on the main roster when he was kicked in the face, uh, landed on the mat, which uh, led to a concussion problem at that time. When a wrestler would claim that their head hurt and they had a concussion, it was kind of looked at as a way to get out of a match or something like that. Most guys wrestled hurt no matter what it was because that's just what everybody had done before them. And, and Nowitzki didn't want to be looked at as somebody who quit. You know, WWE was his dream job. I mean, he went through that reality show process in order to get there, but he still got there. And um, that's when he started using his Harvard ed education to dig into uh, studying the brain and finding out what uh, CTE was. Um, through, you know, CTE, um, he went out and he started doing interviews and articles, people asking him about being a former wrestler, him giving his thoughts on football. And Vince McMahon really thought that he was going out of his way to say bad things about WWE and the press in his interviews. So Vince brought him in uh, to to try to learn what he had to say, and um, they they believed um, what Nowinski was saying was true, and they had to change their style of wrestling. One of their things that they they changed that was the biggest thing was um, chair shots to the head. Uh, you know, landing on 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 your head, trying to find ways to take bumps almost any other way. Undertaker um, really you know, spoke out saying that chair shots was one of the ways that they told stories in wrestling and they, they had done it from, you know, beginning to end. Um, but, uh, you know, he says that, you know, through taking them away, Vince is the, the boss, what he says goes. They've been able to tell their stories a different way and, and, and maybe it's better. Um, no longer will be WWE being, you know, blamed uh, for wrestlers' deaths. Um, WWE has gone out of their way to, to you know, try to get a better public image uh, with a lot of the deaths that came out of like the, the 90s and 2000s of like the, 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 the 1990 wrestlers that a lot of people grew up with dying way too young. Now, you know, WWE will pay for a wrestler to go to rehab. 
no matter if they're with the company or with the company. If you really think about it, like when Kurt Angle was wrestling for TNA and he needed to go to rehab, it was he reached out to WWE. WWE covered. He wasn't even wrestling for them. He was making company money for another company that was trying to compete with them. But they thought it was the right thing to do um, to, to, to try to get him better um, for, for, for his life, for what he did for, for WWE when he was there. Um, the next jump is probably the weirdest jump of all the doc. Um, we jumped to WrestleMania 30, um, with Undertaker, um, wrestling against Brock Lesnar. It was the first time that they ended the streak. Undertaker said the, the talk, um, of the match was that he was going to win the match. And then all of a sudden, Vince came to him on the day of the match and changed his mind and said that, you know, Brock was going to go over. Um, Undertaker says that he, you know, he he went in to have a good match, even though he was going to lose. It was Vince's idea. It was Vince's company. But he had a concussion that he suffered about five to ten minutes into the match. And the match ended up going 30. He doesn't remember any of it. Um, Vince came out and said that, he didn't think Undertaker got a concussion. He feels that he you know, was under some sort of emotional distress over losing his streak at WrestleMania, and that's the reason why he blocks it out that he says he doesn't remember it. If Vince is thinking that The Undertaker is, is faking um, his concussion um, uh, from WrestleMania 30, why did Vince get up um, from sitting at the gorilla position and go with Undertaker and his wife to the hospital and sit with Michelle McCool and try to consult her. Um, you know, that was the first WrestleMania that Vince was not there, that Vince was not a part of it. And um, the, the whole thing does not make any sense. Cody Rhodes talks about his debut coming into the company in 2007 and how much the... Uh, the wrestling has, has changed and like sort of the, the old wrestler ways um, are, are, are leaving the locker room. You know, there, there's a, a lot less drug use and a lot, lot less drinking. Um, I, I know wrestlers these days, they kind of get a bad rap from a lot of guys for just wanting to go back and play video games. There's no real partying after this. They go to the... I apologize, but this is really how it goes. It's just kind of like... Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Uh, they cover the PG era, uh, basically, um, you know, taking a lot of things out that were, you know, brought to you by the Attitude Era or the Ruthless Aggression. There's a lot uh, less, you know, adult angles um, that were going down, which really rubbed a lot of fans the wrong way. This isn't the wrestling that they grew up on or fell in love with, but I think the, the company has gotten bigger to a point that, um, that there's a lot less of those fans looking in, wondering what's going on. Um, they were able to get bigger deals. One of the biggest one is the Mattel deal. Um, they're the same company that makes Barbies and Hot Wheels now making wrestling action figures. And you can think that wrestling action figures really have gotten a lot better um, in, the, in the last you know 15 years since Mattel took over. The Women's Evolution, which came out of hashtag Give Divas a Chance. I remember the night that everybody was tweeting that during Monday Night Raw, where they were tired of the Divas matches only getting two, three minutes in addition of a Monday Night Raw. There was a lot of good-looking girls on the roster, but there was also a lot of girls that really could wrestle. Um, you know, after the Give Divas a Chance, you know, we had Paige, we had AJ, which were kind of like two of the best workers at the time. You know, after that, we were able to get um, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, Charlotte, Bailey came up to the main roster a year later. And um, the women's division really drastically changed um, from where it had, it, it had been before. Um, and they talked about the McMahon-Helmsley era. Um, or the new era, I guess you can say, of Triple H and Stephanie getting bigger roles inside of the company on the other side. Um, from that, Shane returned at WrestleMania 32. Vince called him up, said that they were pitching an idea for him to make a return to the company that he had left seven years beforehand. Shane kind of just had an on-screen role as a character um, where he would go on to wrestle Undertaker um, in, a, in the Hell in the Cell. 
Um, if he won the match, he was going to take over control of Monday Night Raw. At WrestleMania, he lost. And on Monday night, Vince just came out and said, Shane, if you want it, you got it. One night only. I think he called it Bizarro Land because it was the Raw after Mania and the, and the you know, everything that they wanted the, the fans to do was going backwards. But Vince ran, I'm sorry, Shane ran the next show and then he ran the next show and then he ran the next show. And it was like he just ended up becoming a full time GM. And um, that led to him having a match at WrestleMania the next year. Um, he ended up being with the company for a while until he kind of got released for going crazy, um, booking himself strong at a Royal Rumble and pissing a lot of people off. Um, but uh, they talk about the wins of the WWE at the time. Um, they, they were growing on social media. They were breaking numbers on YouTube as well as Twitter. They were, they were kind of like figuring out trends and getting ahead of TikTok. They launched their own WWE Network. The WWE Network was huge in, in order to like basically not need a DVD collection anymore, just to be able to push a button a lot like you would on Netflix and watch Hell in the Cell matches in order to get ready for a pay-per-view, not having to change the discs around and things like that. Really, really easy. Within a you know a click, you were able to watch Monday Nitro and watch the 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 re debut of the of the NWO um, documentaries, TV shows, Table for Threes. A lot of good stuff came from the network, and then they moved it over to Peacock. You can say that it's basically the same thing, but I'm really to think that Peacock was a step back. They sold it for a lot of money. They got a lot of money for the deal. I think that Peacock mostly wanted to have the pay-per-views in order to have the wrestling fans need a reason to subscribe and knew that they were going to come back month after month in order to watch a show that you know we grew accustomed to paying $30 to $50 for to only get it for $5 a month if you had ads, $10 if, if you blocked the ads on there I, I, but I, but when was the last like classic item of wrestling updated on peacock never i i really hope that the netflix era if that's where it's going is going to be a lot different um uh they asked vince about a secession plan they 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 bring up the fact that shane really wants it a lot of people think that stephanie and triple h are going to get it Vince says that he has no plans on ever retiring. Basically, he says he's going to work until he, he dies. He tries to, you know, get up each day and find a way to, you know, improve and, and find a way to get better. Um, you know, at WrestleMania 38, like I said, it was supposed to be the ending of the documentary. It seemed to me we see him getting in the, the ring with Pat McAfee after McAfee beat... Um, not Grayson Waller. He beat the Austin when he beat Austin Theory. Um, the match that kind of made no sense. It was just a match to get uh, him on WrestleMania. It seemed like seemed like it was going to be the end, and that's where I drew the line. Um, what I say from here, I, I don't really know what I'm saying. I just wrote down pretty much what they were talking about, and I feel icky. I guess you can say talking about it. So. I would appreciate it if you clicked off the video, but um, it was announced that Vince McMahon would be stepping down from WWE, um, the, the, that he had a $3 million payout uh, to, to a, a fair uh, with a former employee. The employee was hired at the company for $100,000 and then immediately given another $100,000 raise to $200,000 after sexual favors. Um, we're starting to pay in. That was the first story that came out that was negative on Vince McMahon from the Wall Street Journal. As people were still trying to figure that out, um, they uncovered that uh, Vince had paid out $12 million in hush money to four different wrestlers, highlighted um, by one former wrestler getting a $7.5 million payout, uh, basically after being forced uh, to have Oral sex um, with Vince McMahon uh, and then having their contract um, not renewed, leading to them being released. I had no idea who this was, so I went up and I looked up who was released from WWE in 2005. Now, this might not actually be a wrestler, 
it looks like a lot of the women that were, I hope it's a woman, uh, a lot of the women who were released from WWE in 2005, a lot of them, more than half of them, looked like they were a fallout of the um, Raw Diva search. Some of these women, I think, ended up getting picked back up. Um, so I, I would knock them off the list. But some of these are names that I remember. And some of them I only remember, but I don't know anything they ever did in it for, for WWE. Amy Weber, Rochelle Lowen, Lauren Jones. All of these are actor slash managers. I think they were just there. Molly Holly um, was released in 2005. Uh, Michelle McCool was released in 2005. Of course, she would be re-signed. Uh, she had to run into the 2010s. Um, we have Miss Jackie, um, who was from Tough Enough. Siri, uh, um, what is that? Season 2. Um, she was a winner. Uh, she was married to uh, Charlie Haas. Um, we've got Don Marie, Joy Giovanni. Um, I thought I saw more. Come on, come on. Christy Hemi. Um, now, a few of those uh, women would go on to have runs uh, in TNA. Um, I don't know any of them that seem like they get $7.5 million payoffs and we're showing it off to the fact that uh, it is what it is. Some of these names I never heard of again. Amy Weber is somebody that would pop up like on uh, WrestleCons and like signings and things that like people were bringing that, her in. I got no clue who that girl is. So I'm not going to point fingers at any of them. I'm just saying those are the women that were released in 2005. Um... After this, um, Stephanie steps down as CEO. As Vince comes back to the company, he says that his job is to land a new television deal as well as find a buyer um, to sell the company to. He says that um, he didn't want to leave last time. He only left because somebody said that it was in his best interest. A lot of people are pointing the finger that Stephanie McMahon was actually the one that said that he should leave. He wanted to have the, the succession role. And once it was realized that she was coming back, that's the reason why she stepped down. We've seen Stephanie step back into the company, like not with a job or a role, but we know that she's at pay-per-views. Who knows? Triple H might ask her for help with things somewhere along the way. Um, Vince then sells the company to uh, Endeavor, um, which would become TKO, TKO Sports. He would stay on with the company, but... He would only own 49% of the company, so he basically had to do whatever Nick Khan, who had a job higher than him or somebody at Endeavor, um, told him to do. I love the fact that they come to sit down for last interviews, and Bruce Pritchard sits down in the chair. You can tell he's not having a great day, and they say, hey, we, we, we heard you saw some of the shows, and he said, yeah, saw them. They ask, what do you think? And Bruce says, it sucks. I, I love the fact that Bruce Pritchard stands up to these guys. He, he, I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? They they edited him out. And then, like, all of the sit-down interviews that he did just get scrapped. And I don't see how he loses in that. But he says he's been real close to Vince for a long period of time. There was a long period of time when Bruce... And Vince were not close to each other from the time that Bruce got fired from uh, WWE by bringing a, a gun backstage. And whether he pointed it at somebody, whether if it, the stories just got mixed up over time, they, they let him go. And, and Vince didn't reach out to him. There was actually a time period when TNA and WWE made like a, a, a trade that... You know, Christian could show up on a TNA pay-per-view if Ric Flair showed up at the um, Hall of Fame. And Bruce and Vince negotiated that on the phone back and forth with each other. And one thing led to another. Maybe it was because, you know, Bruce was doing the podcast. I don't think Vince was listening to it. But 
one day just, you know, Bruce went back to work for TNA after the TNA deal didn't really work out. He just came back to WWE and, you know, it, it wasn't like he was just like a producer on the end of the line. He was right there next to Vince. Like he, he never left and um, they were able to pick up their relationship and Vince worked uh, Bruce's ass off. And anybody who listened to the podcast realized sometimes we were waiting a while <laughs> to get some episodes. Um, but I think Bruce is a better man today. Even after going back to WWE, I think it's it's, it's really changed his life. Um, from there, we go to the Janelle Grant um, uh, allegations that came out with the lawsuit. As far as I know, this lawsuit is still active, but it is on hold with the stuff that's going on with Vince right now. I, I guess it's because it's federal or something. I don't know. Um, they really point the finger. In the, in, in the papers that I read that were released... It never said his name full on. And I'm scared to say it because I don't want to get sued. But this documentary just points out a lot of allegations against Brock Lesnar. Um, that, you know, she, uh, Janelle Grant had sent naked pictures uh, to Vince. Vince shared the naked pictures with um, Brock Lesnar when they were... WWE was trying to re-sign him in 2021. Told, Bruce, uh, told Brock Lesnar that... A part of his contract is that he can have sex with Janelle Grant anytime that he wants. And that signing the contract, Janelle Grant is part of the deal. They actually made a deal to uh, send messages back and forth for a, a setup that never ended up happening. I think it was because of a snowstorm. That's weird stuff, man. It makes me really think about the Sable stuff we talked about earlier a few episodes ago. Um, Ashley Massaro, uh, when she was in the company, she was the winner of the uh, Raw Diva search. I believe she was the... Maria was the... No, not Maria. Shit. No, Christy Hemi was the winner of the first. Ashley was the winner of the second. Um, but, uh, you know, she was uh, raped when she went overseas for tribute for the troops. Vince reached out and told Ashley not to file any charges because of the fact that, um, it would hurt their standing with the National Guard, which was a, a, a big, um, backer of WWE at the time that they had a relationship in. Um, after this comes out, Vince is forced to sell his final shares because he's no longer with the company. And uh, I guess he just doesn't want to be involved anymore. There's always little rumors that Vince is trying to start something up. That would be tough, even for Vince, to have a, a, a startup of a wrestling company. We've seen, you know, AEW got off the ground pretty well. But TNA, they had a real rough launch to that company. Um, and then we go, um, you know, them asking a lot of people what... Vince McMahon's legacy is and didn't matter if it was John Cena the Undertaker a lot of people didn't have thoughts on what his legacy was they just were trying to pass even Trish Stratus couldn't get it but it was Tony Atlas that said that he was the the world's best booker doesn't always agree with the guy doesn't always you know believe that he made the right choices but he was the best, and you can't take that away from him. He made a lot of money. He grew that company, uh, you know, 10 ways from Sunday that we never thought was possible. And um, I wish it had a better ending. But that was the documentary on Vince McMahon. I, I don't even know what to think overall. It would have been a really good puff piece, I'll tell you the truth. But just the ending and just the impending knowing what was coming with the ending was hard. And so, that's it. I had fun. We'll probably do another video wrapping everything up tomorrow, giving my real final thoughts. And I think there's a whole bunch of, like, small videos I can squeeze out of this one as well. So, overall, pretty good night. Peace out, everybody.